Welcome to part two of the voiceover lecture for chapter 13, the respiratory system. If you haven't yet, please watch part one. In part one, we already covered sections one, two, and three. In this video, we'll cover section four on the physiology of the respiratory system. And section five, we'll talk about some of the problems that can occur with the respiratory system. Section four, respiratory physiology. Respiration involves four distinct processes. One, pulmonary ventilation or breathing. Two, external respiration or the exchange of gases within our lungs. Third, respiratory gas transport. That's the transport of gases in our blood. And fourth, internal respiration, the exchange of gases between our blood and our tissues. We'll go over each of these four processes in uh, parts one through four. Pulmonary ventilation, or breathing, is the mechanical process of changing the volume in our thoracic cavity, or chest cavity. If we change the volume of our thoracic cavity, that's going to change the volume of our lungs. That's going to change the pressure of the air in our lungs, and will cause gases to flow in one direction or another. The pressure in our lungs always wants to equalize with the pressure of the atmosphere. For example, if we decrease the volume of our thorax, that's going to increase the pressure on our lungs and increase the pressure of the air in our lungs. The air in our lungs wants to equalize the atmosphere, so the air is going to leave our lungs and we breathe out. Pulmonary ventilation is made of two distinct processes, inspiration or inhaling or breathing in, expiration or exhaling or breathing out. The respiratory cycle is one complete process of inspiration and expiration. Let's discuss inspiration in a little more detail. During normal breathing, inspiration involves the contraction of several muscles, including the diaphragm. The diaphragm is a sheet of muscle found below the lungs. It separates the thoracic from the abdominal cavities. In its relaxed state, the diaphragm is shaped like a dome with the middle portion being raised. When the diaphragm contracts during inspiration, it causes the diaphragm to flatten. The middle raised portion actually lowers. This increases the volume of our thoracic cavity. In addition to the diaphragm, the external intercostal muscles, which are found between each rib, also contract during inspiration. This causes the rib case, cage to raise and also causes the ribs to rotate laterally. Both of those processes also lead to an increase in the volume of the thoracic cavity. Increasing the volume of the thoracic cavity increases the volume of our lungs, decreases the air pressure in our lungs, and causes air from the atmosphere to flow into the lungs. The diagram to the left shows the changes in the thoracic cavity during pulmonary ventilation. This red line represents the diaphragm in its two different positions. When the diaphragm is relaxed, it has more of a dome shape. As the diaphragm contracts during inhalation, which is represented with this dashed line, you can see it's pulled downward and somewhat flattens. This increases the size of the thoracic cavity. You can also see the change in the position of the ribs. During inhalation, the ribs are pulled upward, increasing the size of the thoracic cavity, and that's represented with this blue ghosted drawing. In the diagram to the right, we can see how the muscles move during contraction during inhalation. The diaphragm, again represented with the red line, pulls downward as it contracts during inhalation. And the intercostal muscles pull upward, pulling on the entire rib cage, lifting it upward. I mentioned that the ribs lift upward and outward when the intercostal muscles contract. This diagram shows a bucket and how the handle would move if you were to lift it. This motion is very similar to what our ribs do during inhalation. Let's discuss the process of expiration 
in more detail. During normal breathing, expiration is a passive process and involves the elastic recoil of tissue. Normal expiration involves little or no contraction of muscles. However, during forced expiration, like when you cough or a person with asthma is breathing, or if you're playing a wind instrument, then there is the contraction of muscles. These muscles include the internal intercostal muscles. Internal intercostal muscles are found deeper than the external intercostals. When the internal intercostals contract, they pull the rib cage downward. Additionally, abdominal muscles contract during forced expiration. Abdominal muscles surround our abdominal cavity, and so when they contract, they squeeze on the abdominal organs. Those organs push upward on the diaphragm, lifting it back into place. The diagram to the left shows the direction that the muscles take during contraction during expiration. You can see the internal intercostals pull downward on the rib cage during forced exhalation and the abdominal muscles contract and squeeze on the abdominal organs, pushing the diaphragm back up. On the diagram to the right, you can see the position of the different intercostals between two ribs. Here are the external intercostals, more superficial than the internal intercostals. Another important facet of pulmonary ventilation is intrapleural pressure. Remember that the lungs are surrounded by two serous membranes, the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura, and the space in between is the pleural space, which is filled with a thin layer of serous fluid. We mentioned that one of the functions of this fluid is to help prevent friction as the lungs move. The pleural space must have a negative pressure. A good analogy for this is a suction cup. For a suction cup to stay stuck to glass, there must be no air within the suction cup. In pneumothorax, air enters the pleural space. This is bad. This occurs during a chest wound or blunt force trauma. If air enters the pleural space, the negative pressure is no longer maintained and the pleura can pull apart just like a suction cup would fall off of the glass wall. Without this negative pressure and the elasticity of the lungs, the lungs collapse. This is a very serious condition and requires medical intervention. In this diagram, pneumothorax has occurred. Uh, something has caused a wound in the chest and punctured the pleural cavity. Air is rushed in and you can see the right lung has collapsed. It can be important to measure the various facets of ventilation. We do this using a device called a spirometer. We explore a spirometer and measuring ventilation more in lab. But for lecture, you should know five different measurements of ventilation. First is tidal volume. The tidal volume is the volume of one normal breath of air during rest. On average, the tidal volume is about 500 milliliters or 500 cc's. And on average, we take about 12 breaths per minute. Second, we have inspiratory reserve volume. Remember, inspiration is inhaling. Inspiratory reserve volume is the extra volume that can be inhaled with a very deep, forceful breath. We can breathe in, on average, about 3,000 milliliters of air extra if we force air into our lungs. Third, we have expiratory reserve volume. This is the extra volume of air that can be exhaled with a forceful exhalation. Expiratory reserve volume amounts to about a thousand milliliters of air. Fourth is residual volume. 
Residual volume is the volume of air that we cannot exhale. It's the amount of air that's always left in the lungs, even after the expiratory reserve volume is evacuated from our lungs. It amounts to about 1200 milliliters. We'll discuss this diagram on the next slide. Finally, we have vital capacity. It's the amount of air that we can exchange with the atmosphere. It's the sum of the tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, and expiratory reserve volume, and amounts to about 4,000 milliliters. In this diagram, we can see the various measurements of pulmonary ventilation. The space between these two blue lines, you can see this wave type graph that represents the tidal volume. Again, that amounts to about 500 milliliters of air. This dip right here is the expiratory reserve volume. This is the amount of air that we can forcefully exhale. This peak in the graph represents the inspiratory reserve volume. Again, it's the amount of air we can force into our lungs. And over to the right, we can see the vital capacity is, again, the total inspiratory reserve volume, the tidal volume, and the expiratory reserve volume summed together. This is the total air that we can exchange with the atmosphere. And then finally, this bit of extra air that always remains in our lungs is the residual volume. You don't need to concern yourself with the other measurements listed in this graph. How do we control pulmonary ventilation? From signals from our brain. The normal rhythm of breathing is set by the medulla oblongata. Remember that the medulla oblongata was one of the three parts of the brainstem. The pons also helps control pulmonary ventilation. Its function is to smooth the transition between inspiration and expiration. All of this can be overridden by the cerebrum when we are taking voluntary breaths. The second part of respiration is external respiration, which is the exchange of gases between the lungs and the blood. External respiration is driven by simple diffusion, the movement of molecules from a high concentration to a low concentration. Because of diffusion, oxygen leaves the air in the alveoli and enters into the blood, and CO2 leaves the blood and enters the air into the alveoli. The third component of respiration is respiratory gas transport. This is the transport of gases in the blood. Let's begin with oxygen. Oxygen is mostly carried by the protein hemoglobin, abbreviated capital H little b. Hemoglobin is found in our red blood cells. A small amount of oxygen is dissolved directly in the blood plasma. In contrast, CO2 is mostly carried in the blood plasma. And this is because CO2 is far more soluble than oxygen. Within the plasma, CO2 is converted into bicarbonate ion, HCO3 minus. A small amount of CO2 is carried by hemoglobin. This is a good point to discuss carbon monoxide poisoning. Carbon monoxide is a small molecule made of one carbon and one oxygen. It's a colorless, odorless gas. Carbon monoxide is the leading cause of death during a fire. Carbon monoxide is so deadly because it outcompetes oxygen on the hemoglobin molecule. So the more carbon monoxide you're exposed to, the less oxygen you can carry in your blood. Carbon monoxide poisoning results in flu-like symptoms that include headache, dizziness, and vomiting. The final component of respiration is internal respiration. It's the exchange of gases between our blood and tissues.
like external respiration, internal respiration is driven by simple diffusion. Oxygen leaves the hemoglobin molecules from our red blood cells and enters into the body's cells, providing those cells with oxygen to help drive the production of ATP. CO2 diffuses from the tissues of the body into the blood. It dissolves in the blood plasma and is converted to bicarbonate ions in our red blood cells. This diagram shows the various levels of oxygen and CO2 in our lungs, blood, and tissues. Take a moment to look at the levels of these gases and think about how this drives the process of diffusion and the movement of the gases into and out of our cells. This diagram shows the movement of oxygen and CO2 in and out of our blood. You don't need to know all of the details on the slide. What's important to know is that oxygen moves out of the alveoli and into the blood, and CO2 moves out of the blood and into the alveoli. This represents external respiration. The diagram to the right shows internal respiration. CO2 moves out of the tissues of our body and into the blood, while oxygen moves out of the blood and to, into the cells of our tissues. In the fifth and final section, we discuss various problems that can arise in the respiratory system. One of the most common respiratory problems is known as rhinitis or inflammation of the nasal mucosa. Um, rhino, the prefix rhino means nose. Rhinitis is caused by various allergens like pollen grains in the air, viruses like rhinovirus and coronaviruses, which both cause the common cold, and influenza viruses. Rhinitis can also be caused by bacterial infections. Symptoms of rhinitis include a runny nose and post-nasal drip. Next is COPD. COPD stands for Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Diseases. One of the main causes of COPD is a history of smoking. Some of the symptoms include dyspnea, which is labored breathing. Another symptom is frequent pulmonary infections, coughing, and hypoxia, which is the retention of too much CO2 in the blood. COPD includes two different problems, chronic bronchitis, which is infl inflammation of the lower respiratory tract, and emphysema, which is destruction of the tissues of the lungs. Third is lung cancer. Lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death in North America. 90% of lung cancer cases are due to smoking. Unfortunately, lung cancer has a very low cure rate. Lung cancer is caused by the toxic, toxic chemicals that are found in cigarette smoke. There are three types of lung cancer. Adenocarcinomas develop from bronchial glands or alveolar cells in the respiratory tract. Squamous cell carcinoma develops from the epithelium of the bronchi, and small cell carcinoma develops from a special type of cells, neuroendocrine cells, that have the properties of both neurons and endocrine cells. Finally, we have asthma. Asthma is chronically inflamed, hypersensitive bronchial passages. Symptoms of asthma include wheezing, coughing, and shortness of breath, and can be very serious. The causes of asthma are not well understood, but are thought to be a combination of both genetic and environmental factors. One of those environmental factors includes cigarette smoking during pregnancy and exposure to cigarette smoke during early childhood. Another environmental factor is exposure to air pollution. One explanation for asthma and the rise in the incidence of other allergic diseases is the hygiene hypothesis. This is the idea that growing up in too clean of an environment with little exposure to pathogens causes problems in the development of the immune system.
And that's the end of part two for the voiceover lecture for chapter 13, the respiratory system. This is also the last video in our voiceover series for Bio 50. Good luck on your tests and hope to see you next semester.